You're tuning into the podcast series, We Talk Cyber with Monica, your platform for engaging discussions and expert opinions on all things cyber. For more information, check out monicatalkcyber.com and let's hop right into today's episode. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to today's episode of We Talk Cyber with Monica. We have yet another fantastic episode and an amazing guest today who's joining us, none other than Chris Dale from River Security. He's the founder and also teaching at the SANS Institute. He's teaching the SEC 504 course on hackers' tool techniques, exploits, and incident handling. It's lovely to have you on board today on the episode, Chris. Hi, welcome to the episode. Hello, thank you. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. Would you like to say a few words about yourself, Chris? Sure, absolutely. Uh, my name is Chris Dale. Uh, American accents, but actually from Norway, Bergen. So uh, just grew up with Cartoon Network and, and the internet, basically. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, born in, and raised Norwegian, you could say. Uh, IT geek for, um, from since the beginning. I've been doing uh, development, IT operations, information security management, and for the past five, six years, building up uh, penetration testing units and incident response teams for uh, net security and just recently went to uh, to found my own company and, and grow my own type of ideas and, uh, and company structure. It's going to be awesome. So what is it that you do at your company? What is your company about and what is it that you primarily do? So River Security is all about uh, offensive services primarily and also cyber consulting because uh, in, in consulting we do, or at least in offensive security, we do get a lot of insight in terms of architecture and which defenses work and so on. So there's a, there's a natural consulting site uh, to, to support the offensive services, but basically it's penetration testing, typically what people would call it. So also consider things like red teaming where we're actually doing the full on break-ins at companies and where we, we're targeting them just like any modern attacker would. Uh, so that's the primary thing. And the ni- name of the company, River Security, is actually, it's basically a river. So a literal river, that's, that's our idea. Uh, mm-hmm. There are many rivers within information security. Like we can look at flows of data, for example, and so on. But the name originally comes from the idea of doing what we call upstream thinking. We want to solve the root causes. And it has a kind of funny story to it. Uh, say, for example, you're passing over a bridge uh, that is, uh, there's a river running o- under the bridge. And you see someone coming down a river asking for help. Well, they're drowning and you need to help them out of the river. Someone is already there rescuing these people flowing down the river. You help them. And as you help them, all of a sudden you see another person flowing down the river. Mm-hmm. So you're, you realize you're going to be stuck here. You're going to be stuck here for hours because there's more and more people coming down the river that you need to rescue. And eventually you tell the other individual that you've been helping that, hey, I need to take off. We're going to, I'm going to leave. And they tell you, no, 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 you can't leave. You need to stay put. You need to do, you need to rescue all of these people. And then you tell them, look, I, I agree. We need to rescue the people, but I'm going to go upstream and find whomever is kicking out all these people into the river. I need mm-hmm. to find that individual and I'm going to deal with the root cause because that's the reason why we're here. And that applies to IT in so many areas. Mm-hmm. Uh, like look at patch management, for example. We need, to, we need to continuously govern and understand the risk of our companies. And patch management is, is critical and integral in, in understanding our business risk and controlling it. Fantastic. I mean, that's a very thoughtful name to the company, to be very honest. And it's very true that a lot of the Pentis, as we see, they are different uh, findings that we that come out in these pen test reports that are iterative because you see that you have fixed certain flaws but they are not fixing the root cause and then you keep on finding yeah. the same problem again and again in different software different points uh, and different services so it really exactly. makes sense to look at the root cause and tie the root cause or problem management to incident management and mm-hmm. to pen testing to really understand and do that so what is pen testing and how is it different from red teaming? Right. So penetration testing is basically the act of approaching a target, some service, maybe a web application or a network, say an IP address, for example. We approach that asset and we try to find vulnerabilities. Some type of thing that might pose a risk to the target company. 
It might be the leak of, for example, GDPR sensitive data, or it might be very strong technical, technical vulnerabilities that allow us to take over the entire service and, and, and install malware, for example, inside of the target company. So that's a typical pen test. We approach a certain few systems and we try to figure out the risk associated with them. But red teaming is, is different in, in the sense that we are not necessarily given a lot of restrictions. We normally have a long duration of the engagement and our restrictions are more like, uh, don't kidnap anyone. <laughs> or, right. or don't, don't do anything yeah, don't, unethical unethical or illegal things, right? But uh, target us like any, say, for example, motivated nation state attacker would. Someone willing to do, for example, corporate espionage. Mm -hmm. So that means that we will, for example, not only do the penetration testing of assets, we will call up individuals on their phones, pretend to be their suppliers, to right. try to get a password reset, for example. We will show up at a factory or at a, our office location and plant covert devices to build in back doors to the networks. We will do all of that stuff in addition to the regular penetration tests. But we want to prove that we can be successful and where the customers need to focus their defenses uh, if they were to try to defend against more motivated threats. We will try to be as smart as we can about this and, and try to just make sure that we can demonstrate risk. And risk, it comes in many flavors, but say, for example, you want to define your crown jewels. So what is what, what does my company need to protect? Well, it might be your intellectual property, say, for example, schematics, drawings, or your how-to, how you approach business, for example. You define this up for us, and that's what we want to seek out and try to steal. Mm -hmm. And we can steal that by just simply walking right into your office and opening up the door to the server room and stealing a server. That's how you're going to do it, right? Not necessarily through super sophisticated means. So it covers right. all of those things. Right. So then that brings us to actually a very important aspect of pen testing, security testing, or red teaming, which is the human behavioral aspect of it. During the course of pen, uh, red teaming, you could just call up individual, try to social engineer them, trying to find out how you can abuse that trust right. or whatever that is. A recent report came out from Microsoft talking about the cyber attacks and the change of landscape amidst COVID-19 and the pandemic. Mm, yeah. And also if you look at the Verizon DBIR report and many other studies and sources that talk about how human behavioral aspects are obviously abused quite a lot by uh, attackers in the real time, right? So it's not just about technology. More often than not, it's about attacking people, right? So how does red teaming take that into account and basically help organizations also understand their weak spots if they're vulnerable to that kind of attacks and so on? So, so in my opinion, right? And I'm quite frank on my opinions. Humans are always going to make mistakes, no matter what. Even me, like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cybersecurity expert. I'm going to make a mistake next time, and I'm the one who's going to allow bad guys into my environment, right? So humans are always going to make that mistake. So in our red teaming engagements, when I'm in a dialogue with a CISO, for example, I actually tell them, look, we know we're going to be successful on the accounts of tricking people into giving up their credentials or running malware, etc. So why don't we just skip that step and give us some access? Why don't you just give us a laptop in the environment that we pretend that has been compromised, where we don't have to trick someone in double clicking someone, we'll just take that access. We've been given that access and we'll assess your networks to see how resilient they are for when users make mistakes, not if. Right. So, but how do you then help organizations defend against those mistakes? Does that, is that a part of red teaming or is it then only through security awareness? So security awareness is obviously a great thing to help customers build that awareness to so make it into, a, for example, a lunch meeting. We can talk about what has happened and how we, we did the engagement and so on. But, but awareness is just one thing. People are going to make those mistakes. So mm -hmm. when we get in, we want to see the customers move towards architectural changes. For example, the segmentation of services 
the principles of least privileges being assigned to their users, the, the installation and operation and configuration of, say, endpoint detection or response systems, and the response when alerts trigger from these systems. Because that's how we actually survive. We can do all the awareness that we need to do, and that's great. We might lower mm -hmm. the amount of people compromising themselves on behalf of the organization. But when it, when, the, when it all comes down to it, we need to have systems to support users making mistakes. Right, right. So with regards to the attackers, techniques and tools, how has the attack landscape or the threat landscape evolved in the past decade? Has there mm. been a considerable evolution or are attackers just trying to still abuse the easiest means possible, whether it's through social engineering or phishing, where do you see the attackers investing and how do you see the threat landscape has evolved over the past decade? Right, well, well here's, there's a bunch of things on this topic, right? Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, um, attackers most of the time are not zooming in on you as an individual trying to hack you they're just say fishing with hand grenades right they're just spraying and praying that they will hit someone with their attacks that's most of cyber attacks and you as a company you might just be victimized because well you weren't running faster than the other ones right you were the slowest one to to run from the beer and you were caught because you forgot to patch for example a vulnerability so you could be so you could be collateral damage Collateral damage, absolutely. And this is what we see with a technique called credential stuffing, for example. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that, say you register for an account at linkedin.com, where you and me have been talking quite a bit, right? And this linkedin.com system gets hacked. Then that means your username and credential for LinkedIn is now compromised. They're in the bad guy's hands. Now this username and password can then be applied to every other account that you might own. So mm -hmm. even company accounts, say VPNs and, and access to Office 365 and mail accounts, that same password might work across those services. And in those cases, you're definitively collateral damage. Someone else had a problem and you got compromised because of that. Um, there's also a huge change in, in the past 10 years in how bad guys monetize us. Right. This has become a, a huge industry. We're talking billions of dollars every year. So what has changed from, from in a very abstract perspective is that it used to be all about bad guys installing a bot on victim species, and they would maybe use that bot to cause massive amounts of denial of service, for example, say DDoS attacks. Maybe they would steal some sensitive data here and there, but there wasn't this grand plan of monetization. And then around 2010, 11-ish, we saw Stuxnet, Flame, and Dooku, malware that was designed by military to start compromising other nation states and, and cause kinetic effects within facilities of, say, uranium enrichment facilities in Iran. That's mm -hmm. like, okay, crazy. But the big change in types of monetization is when cyber criminals were able to install ransomware because with ransomware and also now with cryptocurrency mining, the, 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 the criminals, the bad guys are threat act actors. They don't require any infrastructure to run this. There is no command and control channel, no server in the cloud that law enforcement can necessarily take down. Most of the time it's just fire and forget for the criminals. They will set, it, set you up with a ransom letter and now you have to approach them with a certain number of money and you will get your encryption keys back. And that, that changed things quite, quite immensely in the industry because it's no longer about taking down a command and control, it's about securing your environments and making sure that you don't get compromised anymore. And the same thing is with cryptocurrency mining. This is also quite a bit changed because now attackers, they don't even want to play their hand anymore. They don't want you to know that you've been compromised. So they will just stay silent on your system. And only when your system is not in use, they will start gradually using more and more CPU and start mining these cryptocurrencies to award them money. Mm -hmm. And they don't want you to detect them because that means that they will lose their access. In fact, the criminals might even patch your system and make it resilient just so no one else will come in and make a mess on the system, right? 
Right, right. So they basically have, of course, become smarter in the way that they also think of the ROI, right? How much they're investing and what is the returns that they have on these hacking and attacking organizations. And one point that yeah. you bring out here, it's not necessary that you get attacked or hacked just because you have been targeted, but mm. that you become collateral damage amidst something that has been sent either through like supply chain attacks basically yeah. trying to attack the vendors and then their customers and consumers basically get hacked through that due mm -hmm. to digitalization, interconnection. And I also talk a bit about, as you say, it's not just if, but the question of when, but I feel like Absolutely. we should also go one step forward for the businesses because it's not just a question of if or even when anymore, but how much, what impact. And the, the question that you bring about ransomware is very important because when you do get hacked, right? you really need to already do your quantitative analysis of how much is your risk exposure in quantitative terms to be able to actually justify the investment into security that you are either willing or not willing to make. And that's yeah. why the question goes way much forward than it's not the question of if or when anymore, but how much impact will it be when you do get hacked, right. either directly or through collateral damage. And, and that, 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 that kind of sets the scene now for organizations. They mm -hmm. don't talk if, they talk when, and they talk how much. That means that they cannot start understanding how much would our reputation burn? What is our data worth? So you can start like uh, qualitatively and also quantit quantitatively, basically try to estimate the values of these bad things happening to you. And you can then maybe see how well that return on investment for a security solution will counter those risks. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you this, it's, it's in some of the cases. So what we see in the media, it's just the top tip of the iceberg, okay? So we hear about Noskidlo, for example, we hear about Visma and so on getting hacked. <laughs> yeah, there's at least a, a, a couple of times a month where people are calling me or my team or are engages in instant response where their companies is about to go bankrupt because of hackers. I've seen it with my own eyes where an entire company is mm -hmm. lost. There is nothing left. Overnight, 25 mm -hmm. years of you building a company is turned to dust. It's now mm -hmm. in attacker's hands. And I, in, in, in this case I was talking about, I, we were basically able to negotiate the price of ransom down to a quarter million Norwegian kroners. So it was literally the board of directors, everyone was like <laughs> celebrating, you know? It was like, pay it, pay it. You should have paid it yesterday, you know? But just to try to get back to normal operations. And that can mm -hmm. be sad. Right. And talking about risk quantification, I think we can, that is a whole topic in itself, which probably we should take it in a separate episode. But uh, coming back to the, coming back to the businesses, right? And for them, it is for them to understand what impact can this have on the organization? What can this mean for them? What is one critical thing you believe businesses should keep in mind and should be very aware of in building their defense against cyber attacks? Right. Uh, so this boils down to one thing that we could talk about shortly, just multi-factor authentication that helps a quite a bit, multi-factor authentication, okay? But, but I don't wanna talk about that, okay? Because if you're not doing it already, you're doing something wrong. You need to have a plan on how to build multi-factor authentication across your entire service edge, okay? Now, the thing I wanna talk about is segmentation. Mm -hmm. It is about controlling services and making sure that you control in and out of your services. Mm -hmm. and, and some people look at me and they go, well, that's really hard. And I go, not really, not that hard. Well, that's really expensive, they tell me. Not really, not that expensive. It depends on how you approach this. Mm -hmm. And I've done this myself. I've been in IT operations. I've built the clusters of micro-segmented services and I've whitelisted database traffic, web traffic, and made sure that once a service is compromised, it doesn't mean everything else falls. Mm -hmm. Because services, they will get compromised. And then we need to isolate that compromise, make sure that we can detect it in time and contain the problem before they're able to spread. And that spreading, 
uh, has been, there's a, a paper by CrowdStrike in 2019 where they measured that some threat actors, particularly the ones from the Russian threat actors, the, what we call the bears, uh, they were down to only 18 minutes from the time they have compromised a system to when they have pivoted and done lateral movement within your environment. Mm -hmm. 19, 18 minutes. So that, that in order to defeat those type of numbers, we need to start to control our environments in a much greater sense. Mm -hmm. And segmentation helps us with this. And it's natively built into the cloud in most cases. Within the cloud environments, you will notice that, hey, there's built-in segmentation here. And it's not rocket science. Just mm -hmm. whenever we're talking on-prem stuff, people freak out and they go like, no, we can't do that. And I go, yes, you can. You just have to talk with the right people and you will be able to start segmenting things away, uh, especially when we're talking about businesses in Norway, which is mostly small business, uh, small medium businesses, right? It's not huge conglomerates of fortune, hundred mm -hmm. fortune thousands and so on. It's not that big of a deal in most cases. Right. So that's a very good point. And when you talk about segmentation, that's one aspect. Where does... and not talking about multi-factor authentication, but in general, because we have now understood with the cloud and all these network interconnections and so on, identity and access management is obviously mm -hmm. the new logical perimeter. Yes. What role does that play in defending your infrastructure, your company, your business, your organization? Uh, it, it plays a huge role. So this might go under the umbrella of what we call secure access service edge, SACE, mm -hmm or zero trust modules, right? Where the network is no longer a factor in authenticating and identifying your users, you actually have to move deeper into who the user is, where they're coming from, uh, what type of equipment they're using and so on. And based on that, you can make a decision whether or not they should receive access to certain devices uh, that the company or the organization can provide them. And that's not based on where you are, not the mm -hmm. network you're coming from, but basically who you are and what identity you can prove to have. And that is actually a great idea because what these platforms give us, so the vendors that are shipping us uh, Serif Trust Solutions, for example, what they're giving us is that they're giving us one common interface for our users to authenticate through. So that means it's gonna be harder to fish it perhaps. It's, it, there are more controls that we can build into that interface to make it visible for the users, what they're expecting to see, for example. It's gonna be familiar and easy. And it also gives us a single point where we can start building defenses. Like single sign-on is something very helpful from a, an availability standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. And multi-factor authentication is something that will cause a little bit of uh, more confidentiality and protection of the system, but it might impact availability of the system. However, when we look at zero trust, for example, we can build this one common interface where these controls take effect across all the applications instead of us having to run to one-on-one -on -one service and implement single sign-on and implement multi-factor authentication and so on. It, it helps us. It makes us more agile and it and hopefully allows us to, to make us faster in how to respond to threats as well so we can shut down things and respond to things. But does that also mean single point of failure? So that's a great point. So you can always argue that all the eggs in one basket, right? But if I have one basket and I protect this basket really well, mm. I make sure that it's patched and I even duplicate that basket. So I have multiple baskets and I duplicate these bas baskets around the world in different data centers and so on. And I know the technology that is supporting my basket. In my opinion, this makes it more secure than the alternative where you have <laughs> like this jungle with all weed everywhere and you have all these funky, nasty things left and right that is, you don't necessarily understand and you're not sure what they're doing and so on. All right. So we have had quite some discussion on technical aspects and the controls. Let's go a bit non-technical. Uh, just to ask you, Apart from obviously COVID-19 being one of the biggest things that have happened recently to the world, what is one of the biggest surprises that you've had in the last months and why? Hmm. Biggest surprises um, was this question, to be honest. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> that might be. My biggest surprise, I think, 
and, and this is a good surprise, very healthy. We're now seeing companies able to turn out changes, not in a matter of months, but in a matter of weeks. What was previously impossible to do, probably dictated by grumpy old men or something like that in the organization that say, no, we can't, no, we can't. We tried 10 years ago, we tried to make that move, it didn't work. All of a sudden, because a crisis is upon us, we can now launch our latest web store. We can now support work from home. We can now support all of these things that are previously was too hard for us to, to mm -hmm. realize and launch, right? And, and we say, we do risk acceptance here, right? We understand risk. We say, yeah, this is going to increase our risk, but that's fine. We can address the risk and try to mitigate it and deal with it, right? And I like that type of thinking because I hate it when information security comes in the way of innovation. And, and I don't like to see companies stagnate when they stop moving. The wheels right. are yours just spinning, right? Because people are telling them no. It's all about yes, but. And we can see with COVID-19, we can. And that's awesome. I want this to be a lesson to everybody out there for, look, COVID-19 taught us a lesson. We can change. I've done this myself in every single work that I've, and every employer, I've always been the one to waddle out in cold water and feel out the temperature and try to make changes. You get burnt a few times, but that's fine. True, so true change and true trying, you will make those changes and it's going to work out fine in most cases. So I just hope people will stop feeling like four monkeys in a cage, but that's a different story for another time. Um just trying to close the conversations today because you're also a trainer and obviously education is definitely one of the critical aspects in any field what would you recommend what are your recommendations on reading or listening to people that are either starting in cybersecurity or would like to mm. learn a bit more about that if they're not so tech savvy or if they're not right. really cybersecurity experts uh, perhaps the biggest tip that I can give is, is trying to, well, seek to understand before you try to solve something, right? Try to understand underlying things that are going on. And also um, this field that we're in, IT in general, and especially cybersecurity, is moving really, really fast. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to stay on top of everything. I just remember, was it last year? I went for two weeks on vacation to Rhodes, Rhodes in, in Greece. I didn't bring a laptop. When I got back home, my friends knew more about cybersecurity than I did, it felt like, right? It just moves so rapidly. Just accept the fact that you won't be able to pay attention to everything. But if you can seek to understand what these things are really talking about, then you can much faster grasp new topics and new things that are happening because you've already built this understanding from the bottom up. And there's not a lot of shortcuts when it comes to this. Uh, that, that building up the building blocks of, of IT and understanding how things happen is, in my opinion, integral and it's, it's an important factor in cybersecurity. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris, for that. We'll be signing off uh, today. This was today's episode of We Talk Cyber with Monica. That was Chris Stale, who is the founder of River Security and also a teacher at SANS. Check out his courses. He's doing many of them, but one of the primary courses that he's doing is SANSEC 504, Hacker Tools, Techniques, Exploits, and Incident Handling. Make sure to check it out. It was lovely having you, Chris, on the podcast today. So that was it for today's episode. This is your host, Monica Verma. I'll be back with more fantastic episodes and amazing guests on We Talk Cyber with Monica. Thanks for tuning in to We Talk Cyber with Monica. Do not forget to subscribe to We Talk Cyber in your favorite podcast app and YouTube channel, Monica Talk Cyber. Take care and continue tuning in.